Every morning, my neighbor gets in a big, loud truck, jets off to a local coffee shop, and comes back 10 minutes later with a coffee for him and his wife. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of disruption. There's probably a bunch of cost, and there's going to also be some pollution. Drones would be better, and drone delivery is here. It's real. It's happening. It's not science fiction, but it's not broadly available. Here to chat about is Bobby Healy from Mana Arrow in Ireland, which has already completed over 100,000 drone deliveries. Welcome to Tech First, Bobby. Thanks, John. Pleasure to be here again. Absolutely. Second time. You just expanded some new markets. Isn't that true? That's right. Yeah. Well, we're we're in. We started off in Ireland. We're on our third operation now in Ireland, and we'll be announcing the location of our fourth one uh, in the next two months, I think. And so we're going to be going to another very large population in Dublin, about one hundred twenty thousand people here in the suburbs of Dublin, um, and a greater population density actually than most of London. So it will be. Probably by far the largest or most complex drone delivery operation on the planet, we think. Um, not the largest by volume, but certainly the most complex number of aircraft and um, population density we're going to be supporting. And we have chosen our second European Ooh. market. Uh, we haven't announced it yet, um, but it will be a different language than English, <laughs> uh, which is the beauty of working in the beauty of working in uh, Europe. But yeah, so we've identified our uh, second European market and we also announced that we're going to be operating in the USA this year. We don't yet have a date because we're still going through our uh, getting our license from the FAA. So fingers crossed that will be sooner rather than later. Well, but yeah, we're, I mean, we're not looking to we're not we're not there yet. Nobody is to go full throttle up scaling. We're more interested in demonstrating mm -hmm. we can operate in multiple markets and that we can do, say, a thousand deliveries a day in a very dense area. And so that's what we'll be doing by the this summer. We'll be doing a thousand deliveries a day um, in this in Dublin. Nice. Nice. So Europe, some country that does not speak English, I'm, my mind is buzzing, whether that's France, Germany, not sure, we'll find out. Spain, I can imagine, maybe. A couple interesting. And the US, very interesting. Did you take on some new funding recently to help you expand? We so we're funded now. I mean, we kind of one of those companies that's always raising capital. Uh, it's a drone delivery is a hungry uh, game to be in. <laughs> the private markets are not great, as everyone knows. But in the end, it, it is a trillion dollar plus industry. Mm -hmm. right? if, you, if you look at uh, Ark Invest, Kathy Woods' team produced some great research recently. Very bullish on the space, and c certainly it's more than a seven hundred billion dollar industry towards one billion or one trillion. So there is a lot of capital available, N not to say that it's a great market to, to be really? trying to raise capital in. Nevertheless, we're funded till the end of 2024 right now. Nice. And so we have, all, I won't say that we're flush with capital, but we're in a good, strong position, driven, I think, in large part by the fact that we're in Europe, we're making solid progress here on our unit economics, which is what counts. Mm -hmm. um, and so fingers crossed and touch wood, It'll keep going like Almost that. nothing better for a startup than to raise at the right time when it's available and not too crazy expensive and to have it when you need it and not need it and not have it. Yeah. Um, there's, never, there's never a bad time to raise more money. <laughs> never a bad time, uh, but sometimes a bad price. Yes, exactly. Fine. That's a challenge. Talk a little bit about the state of the art right now, your drone, its size, its load, its flight time, delivery distance, all that stuff. Yeah. So our ZX drone, which is our latest aircraft, carries, I'm going to calculate on the fly here, about seven and a half pounds of cargo, uh, three and a half kilos, uh, and 30,000 cubic centimeters. Don't ask me to translate that into uh, cubic inches. It's very It's a large, small car. So it no, <laughs> I tell you, it takes eight pints of Guinness, um, which is obviously the international metric yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's big, and we've basically designed it for the single basket grocery market. So we can take ninety plus percent of the convenience store trips we can carry, uh, and volume is a bigger constraint or difficult thing to power than uh, than weight. Believe it or not, volume becomes a cubic problem. Weight is a linear one, and so. 
our new aircraft can take literally 90 plus percent of the orders that go out from one of the big food delivery companies we can now carry. Wow. And how far? Um, so how long is a piece of string? So you, you, you take into account weight, distance and weather, yeah, right? So as you know, we're flying in Ireland right now. Yeah, so so yeah, well, ground speeds, uh, we, we fly at 16 to 18 meters per second ground speed and now in a 15 meter per second wind, which is, you know, when you combine the two, right, you'd say 30 meters per second, yeah. you're at nearly a 95 kilometer an hour effective speed airspeed you have to be flying at which is big so you take that and distance and so it translates to in europe we think a roughly two to five kilometer radius operation is perfect mm -hmm. and in the usa we think that's about 40 percent more just because usa is spread out more mm -hmm. Um, and our, air, our aircraft can handle that with its eyes closed. And we, we have about a 40% buffer in the tank, worst case flight envelope and, and weather um, brings us back at 40%. So way over budgeted on energy requirements, but you know, it lets you sleep better at night. Nice, nice. Let's talk a little bit about competition. Uh, there's a ton there. Obviously if it's a trillion dollar market, there's going to be Amazon has Prime Air. Uh, apparently, they did 10 houses in the first month, so <laughs> not off to an amazing yeah. start. <laughs> Google has the Wing. first 10 are the hardest. What's that? Yeah, Wing are Wing are awesome. Uh, you know, Amazon are solving a different problem than the rest of us are solving, right? So, Amazon are looking. It looks like to, to solve very long range backyard delivery. Um, five pound cargo like so, so in other words power the amazon business mm -hmm. and hats off to amazon it's a wonderful piece of engineering um nearly impossible what they've achieved with a copter design and yeah i mean it, it may not look great what they've achieved but they've achieved a lot and they're not they're not like a private company like us they don't have the same need for pace as we do mm -hmm. so like a lot of people like to to, to, to kind of point at them as not having done a great job. They have, their, their engineering, their aircraft is a fantastic piece of uh, technology, but solving a different problem than we are. And I look at Wing and those Let, are let's, the gold let's hit standards. Let's Amazon just for um, a second there. Let's hit Amazon just for a second there yeah. and then go on to Google because that is really interesting. Amazon knows who they deliver to right now. They run their own trucks in a lot of cases. They know exactly what the addresses are. They know exactly what the packages are. You talked about weight versus volume. I very often get an Amazon package that is massive and weighs a tiny amount, yeah. right? And so there's a lot of stuff that they can apply to uh, build a solution that works for them. That is an interesting point. Yeah, but like they, I mean, I, I, the stat goes circles around a lot of places. I keep hearing it coming back, but essentially 90 plus percent of Amazon deliveries are five pounds or less, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. so they do a lot of those small ones. And I think, I mean, I, I can't speak for Amazon, but I know that the range, the requirements that they've put in their aircraft kind of suggests that they want to use that for those kind of rural deliveries that are just break the efficiency right. of their normal truck model right? right and that makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense and that uh, might be a bet you know by like amazon, said, they're solving a different problem that, that might be a bet by amazon that rural deliveries are going to get approvals in the u.s faster than really big city urban environments i don't know i it it certainly from a from a pragmatism point of view, you definitely shoot for a lower population density. But if I was living on a farm, I wouldn't consider myself any more dispensable than someone living in a suburb, right? Yes. I mean, the, the the law of large numbers says if you fly enough aircraft, even in rural situations, and it's not safe, someone's going to mm -hmm. pay the price. So I, so you're right in one sense, it's easier like our first operation was in a rural area and funnily we had all the restrictions that amazon have now that's three years ago here in ireland and we had to pause if we're crossing a road all those things that you've heard about amazon that's a natural it's it's crawl walk run right it's kind of you don't get permission to fly as the crow flies until you've done a lot of delivery flights mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. while the regulations are black and white and there's rules there's also a big element of well show me the proof mm -hmm. show me the data mm -hmm. and you have to collect that so 
like I've, I wouldn't hesitate to stand underneath an Amazon aircraft flying over my head, you know. So that's all I need to know. I know the engineers behind that, and it's going to be an awesome product. Is it the right product right now? I don't know, um, but it certainly deserves to be flying. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I wish I had their budget to spend on my aircraft, but I don't. Uh, and our problem is much easier to solve, by the way. We're short range, copter, um, heavier cargo, but the key thing is short range. And mm. once, once you ask a copter to go beyond three or four miles, you start to get into this cliff of, you know, it just becomes a really hard problem to solve. Well, Whereas, as you know, Wing and, and others have solved that with a wing. Great so. segue. I mean, Google is solving that by basically having a traditional aircraft, you know, vertical takeoff or landing, but also flight that is not necessarily supported by the engine having to keep, you know, like a helicopter, a tr traditional drone. Yeah. Interesting yeah. model for you. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, we it's it's harder to do what Wing are doing because to make that safer, you've got all these control surfaces, you know, your rudders, mm -hmm. your ailerons, you've got all these other things going on. And, and you notice from Wing, they have 12 propellers for the vertical <laughs> part of it. So that's where the redundancy comes from. It's not that they need all of those props. It's that those, for the vertical part and the delivery phase, which is the most dangerous, you need a lot of redundancy and hence 12 vertical props. Yeah. So you get a lot more efficiency, of course, from forward flight. But we actually deprioritize forward flight and we say, look, our range requirements are not what wings are mm -hmm. because wings started off rural Australia, yeah. rural America, and even suburban America is much more spread out. Our bet is that the opportunity to commercialize drone delivery at scale is in Europe way ahead of it being in the United States and, and other countries like Canada and I could, I could list them. Mm -hmm. But the US is the furthest behind in terms of readiness for scale operations. And with that comes a kind of almost an easier task of, well, look, the range in Europe is much shorter. Mm -hmm. Your typical population center of half a million people is three mile radius and you're done. Even two, two mile radius and you're done. So, yeah, so you kind of, it's likely that we'll have a different aircraft for the U.S. than we will for Europe. But the, the, certainly we, we expect to be generating significant revenue in 2024. And there's nobody going to be doing that in the USA in 2024. Super interesting uh, because obviously there's dense population centers in North America as well. You've got San Francisco, you've got New York, you've got, but those are incredibly busy, busy population centers, skyscrapers, wires, really challenging places to fly around. I'm sure that it can be done. I'm sure that you can do it, but the regulatory process has got to be quite insane for that. But that's also, I mean, like, there, there's got to be opportunity. The actual, the density we're flying over now, John, is more dense than San Francisco. Hmm. We're flying over 10,000 people per square mile. That's much more dense than San Francisco. Wow. You know, when you think, when you take the high rise out of it, it's more dense. And we're delivering to apartment blocks, all that stuff. Actually, the issue in San Francisco and LA and places like that is the complexity of the airspace, the amount of aviation general aviation traffic going over there and most of it without even transponders wow. you start to get into it okay well how do you identify all of that whereas europe has this concept called u space that pretty much forces conspicuity amongst all aircraft general aviation and drones and you've got this really elegant but simple solution to sharing the airspace it's actually it's not the ground risk that everyone's worried about. It's the air risk, i.e. mid-air collisions and disruption to general aviation, less so than the ground risk. And the ground risk is addressed through good aircraft, mm -hmm. certified, reliable aircraft, and provably reliable. That's, a, that's an engineering problem. But air mitigation is more of a stakeholder coordination problem, which is much more politically uh, difficult I can see. putting it politely i can see that i can see that and yet so much opportunity right i mean like how much does it cost to have somebody sit in the traffic in san francisco or la to deliver something i mean i've sat in that traffic yeah. <laughs> in both yeah. those places new york too i've taken two yeah, hours I mean, from the airport to downtown new york it's a disaster yeah 100 percent. no nobody no i mean it costs about $11 to, to deliver a hamburger. 
right, in the USA, even more as you go further distances, right? And everybody in San Francisco wants drone delivery, yes. literally. So there's such a need, both a problem to solve in terms of the economics of delivery and a customer need for it. Like everybody wants this thing to work. But unfortunately, through a combination of reasons, mostly structural, just about the, the, the number of stakeholders and their strength and the size of general aviation, the model helicopter, model plane, all of these different stakeholders and I won't say vested interest, but they have a reasonable expectation to continue life as it always was. Mm -hmm. But life has to change if you want to share and commercialize or liberalize the airspace. Yeah. And so y Europe is there and, and just the USA is not. And it's going to need some really big, bold political moves, I think, to, to, to push it forward. And I like to think that we're setting a great example here in Europe and showing what it looks like. And I think you'll start to see, and, and our friends from Wing are four miles away from our operation in Dublin. Yeah. And we, we think that's great, right? And we're together showing everyone in Europe and in the USA how it's actually quite straightforward to share the airspace and not to, not to demonstrate that a monopoly could ever exist, but the airspace can be shared and that the systems to share the airspace are relatively, at least from an engineering standpoint, very straightforward. Um, and Europe does what Europe does well, right? Regulation. Europe loves to regulate stuff. And, and in our case, that actually is beneficial. Nice. Interesting, interesting conversation. What I am excited about is a potential to reinvigorate local commerce. Uh, because if you can have local commerce just to every kind of local store, just order from it, get it. Great. How does that work? How does a store on board with you? Do they have to have a rooftop location? Do they have to have space in their parking lot? How do you interface with a local store? Yeah, so we categorize them. So we have, first of all, we have a dark store ourselves. So we have all the local vendors that have non-perishable products. So the bookstore, the hardware store, and they put the products in our actual physical location and we just pick and fly from there. Um, and then from uh, the small vendors, I think the mom and pop restaurant mm -hmm. uh, in, in the suburb, we fly out to them and we pick up the product. So the order comes in, they get it on their point of sale uh, terminal. They say they're preparing it. We, we get notified, the clock starts ticking. We let the consumer know through notification. And then when they say, they hit the button on their tablet to say prepared, i.e. the meal is prepared. Our aircraft takes off, it flies to them, drops the winch, they load it, retracts it inside the aircraft, weighs it while it's retracting it, and then flies to the customer. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the that's a difficult model to make work, but you need that to have the choice in terms of yeah. food for the consumers. And then the other one is the high throughput model where we'll actually place a location. So we'll go on the roof a of a airport. vendor that has a lot of throughput. Yeah. And we'll fly it exactly. We'll fly it straight from there. And we have all three in operation now in Ireland, and they're all valid and they're all required. You can't, there's no point entering a big suburb with only one or two yeah. high throughput restaurants. You need them all, and you need grocery, and you need coffee, and you need pints of Guinness, and you need pharmacy. You need it all. <laughs> so let's say I want to be one of those <laughs> in stores, that order. and I want somebody to come pick up, you know, my. Um, uh, whatever it is, food that's going, do I have to have, uh, how, how much space do I need, you know, outside to enable that? Yeah. You need about a two yard diameter wow. flat Tiny. inanimate space. Yeah. Tiny. Yeah, tight. We don't need a lot of space. And to be honest with you, our, our, the horizontal control of the aircraft is very good. So it, it can keep its position no matter what the wind, very tight. And it's, it's location, you know, assessment, i.e. the GPS and the accuracy of it is absolutely superb. The difficulty comes when, so the reason we need two yards and not, you know, five inches is because we, we pick up the product from a height of about 60 feet. <laughs> and so the winch will actually blow in the wind. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like a circus, but we, we do this every day. Um, the issue is physics, right? You can't stop that pendulum effect. So you need the two yards, yeah, uh, yeah, and that's, yeah. that's 
that's the reason. But it's still, there's no, I mean, I, I envisage a world where there's people living at home, maybe retired even, and they're baking, you know, in Ireland we love to bake brown bread, right? That's our thing, soda bread, I think it's called internationally. You know, you could see a scenario where someone's baking bread all day and selling it online and it's delivered to 30 square miles of customers within three minutes by drone. Yeah. We, can we can make that happen. And, uh, and then obviously the mom and pop restaurant, right now, McKinsey did a great report on this a few months ago, but a restaurant loses money on every order that gets delivered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not a great place well, to be, right? So the, the, I don't know if you've seen the prices on Skip the Dishes lately, <laughs> but it's a very different up. price than if you go to the store, if you go to the restaurant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the only way to make it. But again, it, it, once again, Mc, McKinsey again did another uh, bit of work on this. And the, the average premium that has been paid by a consumer over restaurant prices is between 50 and 60%. Ouch. And yeah, ouch, ouch. But customers want it, right? They're willing to pay, but the problem is they're not willing to pay every day for that type of premium. They'll pay as a treat or once a week or once a month, the whatever, problem. but it's not sustainable. And here's the problem. You got this 50 to 60 50 to 60% premium, but you also get food that is not piping hot, not perfectly yes, fresh correct. and I, for many people maybe they don't care maybe they eat their food lukewarm i have no idea i have a thing i want when i when it's hot food i want it hot and so that's why i just don't yeah. do skip the dishes yeah. very often or if i if we order pizza we pick it up yeah. ourselves and we know how long it's going to take to get back i'm the same yeah I'm, I'm the same the irony is i never use food delivery because it's well, it's wor worse than it being not hot because if you get like a Chinese meal or Indian or something, you can microwave it and it kind of, yep. kind of survives. Um, but all the packaging that comes in, the way it steams mm -hmm. up, it changes the texture of the product. But most importantly, you don't know if you're getting it in 20 minutes or an hour and 20 exactly. minutes. That's the problem. Yep. You know, there's no way to know. And with drone delivery, you're going to know within the second when it's going to be arriving. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the big win. And then, again, our average flight time as of the last 12 months, so a lot of data, two minutes, 40 seconds. Amazing. So nothing changes. Your coffee is hot. Your French fries are crunchy and hot. Everything is the way it should be as if you ate it in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to end off with predictions. We've already pretty much covered that, but you've all also broken my heart because I live outside Vancouver, Canada, and what you're saying is basically, you know, there's going to be some drone delivery. Obviously, Wing is operating and Amazon is trying and they're doing some rural stuff. You're coming to the yeah. U.S., but you're saying Europe is going to get there first in terms of scale and going most places, especially in their core urban centers. And so we're going to be sort of stuck looking out over the Atlantic in envy. <laughs> We'll send you lots of videos. Um, that is not helpful. That's fine. Uh, you can, <laughs> but can I just say Canada will be the the, the regulator in Canada, and and, and uh, there's been a lot of on visual line of sight work and very forward thinking uh, regulator in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I would say actually, you know, Canada will be getting it around the same timeline as when companies like ours are ready to scale and we're going through Europe. There's other markets that are also very interesting for us mm -hmm. and you know we can sandwich the united states with mexico and canada that both seem to be in a position to to enable drone delivery so you're going to be okay in vancouver i think so long as you're not in high rise which you probably are <laughs> i'm not i'm Wait, just trying to figure out your kitchen there if that's a big slice <laughs> have you considered a franchise <laughs> model bobby <laughs> rapid expansion yeah, so of course i consider anything uh, when we IPO, we'll start a franchise business, but not until. Interesting. So anybody who's listening, I'm thinking about it myself. You could own a drone delivery franchise. Very, very cool. Bobby, as always, it's been a pleasure. Um, look forward to hearing the news about where you're going to land figuratively and literally in Europe as well, mainland Europe, as well as the US. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much.